Greetings. Welcome to the presentation that will discuss traditional esoteric healing and science. These two seem to want to look at what's different, what's different. What we're doing here in this presentation is looking at what's similar, what's similar. How can we support each other? How can we build a bridge as opposed to building a fence or a wall? That's what we're looking at here today. This presentation is done in a good way and with a good heart and is meant for those people who are curious about these kind of things. I hope. This presentation was put together for the Noetic Society in Taos in the year 2013, a little bit before Christmas. This invitation in no way says that Noetics endorses this, nor any other group or organization. This presentation is meant to stand on its own, an island unto itself. Have my faith healing work have scientific equipment would go out to the decimal point zero zero zero. But before I talk about that, I'd like to give a little background on myself, please, why I'm here. I was trained in Native American healing arts in three different Southwest disciplines. I trained for 10 years as an apprentice in the School of Hard Knocks, which means if I did something wrong, I got a hard knock on my head, which turned into <laughs> a wealth. And if I said anything or squirm, then I had a wealth on top of a wealth. <laughs> so I learned very young on not to be, just to take my medicine. I can't do that in the way that I teach nowadays because I'll get sued and everybody will run away. <laughs> so okay, in these 10 years, one day they uh, said, my son, today I cut the string. And they cut the string and they said, from today forward, you are no longer my apprentice, you are my equal. Go into the world and do what we train you to do. That was a very startling day for me because I was used to being an apprentice for 10 years, not really doing anything, just studying. And I said, well, where do I go and who do I teach? And they said, don't worry, my son, the Spirit will guide you. I'm going, oh, come on, man, you know people, give me a name in Chicago. Uh, just go, go, go. Like, oh, man, here I go, what am I going to do? So that's where the journey began. But people ask me, too, brother, you have three teachers and... I don't have no teachers, and I've been looking for 20 years for a teacher. How is it you get three teachers and I got none? And the fact about it all was that I did not look for these teachers. They pointed their fingers at me and said, come with me. I didn't ask for this kind of work. Back in the old days, I was just a money maker. I owned quite a few companies, and I was very good at making money. But one day, making money lost its interest to me, and I just said, I'm tired of this. I'm going to work for one more year and save up, and I'm going to quit. And that's what I did in my early mid 20s, something like that, mid to late 20s. I quit working uh, time card 95 kind of work and went on my journey. So, when these scientists came and basically took their white glove off and went to me, you know, like, I'll duel you in the morning, you know, bring the pistols or swords. I said, well, okay, well, let's do it. What do you want to do? And they said, well, you call us up and we'll come and test your. Clients. So what I normally do as a routine is I, I, I do 10 clients a day healing work. I start in the morning and I work till all 10 clients are done. So I call the scientific team up and I said, all right, I got healing going over at Port Macquarie, uh, Australia. I got 10 clients lined up, come on over, bring your equipment. So what they did was they tested the client before they came in the healing room. They stayed in the healing room with me for one hour, and then after they got out, they tested them again with their scientific equipment. We went to point zero 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 zero. So, why would I permit this kind of stuff? What if I'm a charlatan? What if I'm not really doing anything? What would I have to be afraid of? Well, I am who I am, and I do what I say I can do, and I said, bring it on and, and do your testing. So, after a whole 10, client and a day of testing, the scientists come out with the conclusion that every single person that came in had an advancement toward better health, if not the health situation was completely gone. Now, my name is not G-O-D. I do not know everything and I cannot fix everyone. But I have a higher rate than most doctors in the hospitals as far as bringing people back to balance and harmony. And I don't really like the word to use 
the word cure very much or heal mm -hmm. because what our real objective is to bring them back to balance and harmony as much as we can at that time with the tools that we have available at that time. So my belief in this world is there's two languages. There's a language of faith and there's a language of science. Sometimes the faith people will listen to the language of science, but very rarely will the science language listen to the faith people because they, your woo-woo stuff, where's your proof, where's your evidence, I want to see some decimal points, so this is what I'm doing. One of my jobs that my teachers assigned me to was to be a, a bridge between the faith and the no-faith people. And not that they mean scientific people that they don't have faith, it's just that they speak in a different language. So my great idea was that let's get the scientific equipment and teams in here to do the testing, and then when we show it to them in their language, there's nothing they can refute. They can't say, oh, that's woo-woo stuff, or oh, we don't believe that, because they have the scientific evidence presented to them in decimal points. So the presentation that we're going to be doing today is with a thermal brain imaging, and also with brain mapping. So what happens is that for 20 years, this PhD uh, researcher who did this study that we're going to see here in a little bit, first 10 years he did his testing without scientific equipment, and then 10 years into his research, they started coming out with these kind of new machines that tested things like the synaptic electrical impulses in the brain, and they were able to actually record these and map them. So what happened after years and years of using this kind of equipment, we discovered what the norm was in the society. If you can go along with the word norm, but you know, we're talking test results from scientists and they say that an autistic brain has a map that looks like this and then a norm brain looks like this. So you can measure the decimal points in between and that's what I was looking for. So I said, okay. So. The test that's on this PowerPoint presentation is quite simple. We had a lady who's a double PhD computer science professor at a private university in Houston. And she got in a car accident and hit her head right here on the steering wheel or something. And she damaged her brain, which she killed a part of her brain, which uh, facilitated the short-term memory. So she had short-term memory loss. But she's a professor in a university. She had to go to school and do her work. Well, she couldn't remember where her work was. She couldn't remember where her keys were. And she couldn't remember where her lesson plan was. And it was wreaking her havoc. But she's a quite high-paid professional. So she brought in this Dr. Uh, Yorke, who did this PowerPoint presentation, to measure her brain and to see what was wrong. And sure enough, in the brain measurement, you'll see here clearly that the left part of the brain here is different than the rest of the brain, which means it was dead. It was killed. And science says when a part of your brain is dead, there is no such thing as reanimation. Dead is dead. So the study was to heal the client purely by faith. That means no touching, no instruments, no anything other than the power of faith. So the experiment was eight minutes. So she sat in a chair, the same chair every time, and the healer that she brought in from the Amazon, the little pygmy guy that she had a lot of money, brought him up to heal her. He did his work and then they tested her, no change. She brought in a Siberian uh, shaman. She brought in a curandera from Mexico. She brought in a lot of different people over a four year period until the doctor was uh, made aware of my uh, healing arts through uh, a horse program with autistic kids in Houston, because I do a lot of volunteer work with autism. So because of that group, the scientists heard about me and said, hey, can you come in and work on our person? I said, what's the deal? She says, you got eight minutes, you can't touch the client, you have to totally use faith only, and we're going to measure your brain, her brain, before and after, and we're going to see what's going on. I said, whoa, sounds good to me. Tell me a little bit about your background. He says, I presented scientific conferences. I am a lecturer. I said, okay, that qualifies you as top in the field. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. So we set up the, there was actually two of us, myself and a 
Dr. Patrick Price, a chiropractor by day and faith healer after 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a few of us that work like that, or he does. So we sat her in a chair, and before all that, I had to sit in a chair like this with a mask on, could not blink my eyes, and could just breathe smoothly for 14 minutes to find out what the norm is, what my brain map norm is. So when you take an aura photograph, it's a snapshot of the aura around you for that moment. But the reason why I had to sit for 14 minutes is because we don't want a snapshot, we want to know what the norm is. I could change anybody's aura in this room in one second. Who, who thinks I can? Show me that. Yeah. Yeah. Who thinks I can? Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, one volunteer. One Just stand right here and face me, please. Okay. Let's say right now her, her aura is like an orangish kind of saliva in my face, in my mouth. I'm going to project that toward her and slap her at the same time. In one second, her aura turns to red. Right. Okay, so that's okay. I, 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 I accept doubters and I, I encourage that. Just one time, an aura camera like that, a camera projector, and say, say a color. I said orange. Orange. Purple. Purple. There's people that have certain gifts in this world. Just like the ones that can hear ley lines, electromagnetic people, there's people that can actually hear these lines. They have a special gift that everybody doesn't have. So once we got the norm, the baseline of mine for 14 minutes, then that comes up on the screen. And then I do a thing that I call what's called juicing up. So I rub my hands, rub my feet, anchor myself down into the earth, anchor myself up to the universe, connect to the stars and the earth and all between, and I call this juicing up. And because I've been a healer for 15 years professionally, this takes me about two minutes to do. Now, in this presentation, there's two things that science says are impossible. And one of the things that, are, that science says is impossible is to go from this normal state of mind into a juiced up state, which you're gonna see on the presentation in two minutes. So that left me six minutes to do the healing. So you'll see in the presentation, I could not even blink my eyes. And in six minutes, you'll see the results for yourself on the presentation rather than me telling you. So, well, uh, our webmaster here, guys, getting us dialed in. He's really, <laughs> I plugged this computer into my 46 inch TV screen and work on there day and night, and it's just a little challenge, it's okay. So in the meantime, I would like to play a little flute song for you, see? I'm trained in what we call a beaver medicine, and we call this beaver medicine, because the beaver makes a dam, and when the beaver makes a dam, his pond gets up, and he makes his home, and then his family lives in the dam. And some people in our communities are what we call beaver people, they're very private people. They don't discuss their personal feelings. They don't discuss their past history with anybody. They're just private people. It's nobody's business. So how do they relieve stress and tension? Well, the rest of us go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and we talk about it, and we get it off our shoulders. But you take a fever person in, it's not going to do no good. They won't talk. No matter how many years of psychology you've got, you can't make them talk because they feel it's private. <laughs> so when our breath goes into our body, it mixes and gathers with the spirit of ourselves, and when it comes out, part of our spirit comes out with that breath. So we find in the healing world that when that breath takes on audible um, characteristics, it now relieves stress and tension, just like talking to the psychiatrist, but this is in sound. So we use this tool as a reliever of stress and tension. And also, I use this tool as a self-esteem builder for young men in trouble with the law we call Tough Love Programs, which I've worked for as a volunteer for many years. It's at Two Feather, we got a big problem with our young men in our Tough Love Program. We've been convicted of crime and now uh, put to prison, and they, every time there's a bed open, they put a prisoner in there and rehabilitate them. And they said our young men have a problem with self-esteem. It's been beat out of them, kicked out of them, it's been told out of them, you're dumb, you're stupid, you're a rotten apple, you're never going to amount to nothing, you're bad, bad, bad. 
And when you're a kid growing up and all these grown-ups are telling you that, sometimes you believe, we all know that's not true, but when you're a young kid, what do you know? So what I do is I teach them a very simple way to read and write music. Buffalo, bear, wolf, fish, eagle, turtle. And when they learn how to write bear, bear, wolf, fish, eagle, turtle, they can make music. <laughs> and when they've been told you're stupid and dumb and you can never do nothing, and then they do this. And then they say, what? I made something that was beautiful. Well, what about what all these people have been telling me? I'm not so stupid after all. I really did something that beautiful. So no, I'm not believing any of this stuff that's coming on from the outside of me anymore. And that's part of where we're at with noetics. I have been in my adult life someone who had visions of this wonderful community of the future. And for years and years, I developed my community, my community. Part of it's electrified, part of it's non-electrified for people who want to live in different ways of life. We had a council of elders to make protocol for the grown-ups, and we have a council of youth for youthful offenders and let the youth people dealt with youthful offender issues. You'd be surprised how creative these young people can come up with ideas that I couldn't even think of. So then I met a man named Jacques Fresco. How many people heard of this man's name before, Jacques Fresco? Do yourself a favor. Go on the internet and look for the Venus Project. Oh, Venus Project, yeah. Jacques Fresco, he's a 97-year-old man. He is the most intelligent human being walking the earth that I know of. And I've been around the world 14 times, and I've spoke to many leaders and communities. There's a little book on the table there that shows some of his visions about the future. And he says, future by design. And I, I believe that's a big part of noetics. Because the future will come no matter whether we participate or not. And when the future comes and we have no hand in, in participating, and when it comes, we can cry all we want, but we didn't do anything to have a change in that. And also in the Native American world, we consider ourselves stewards of this Mother Earth so that the unborn have a worthy place to come to. And I find that very ingrained in noetics. To me, and, and I'm not really a noetics person other than I've read a little bit, but to me, noetics is the proof of faith stuff. And that's exactly what we're doing here today with this presentation. We're here to show the scientific proof that things that this conscious world and the medical society believe are not possible, are possible. When we limit ourselves with this kind of indoctrination, so be it. These are your limits. I choose my limits, and my limits are the sky. And that is the limit on my creativity and my ability. So we'd love to play a short little song here. Let's put some good juju on it. <laughs> 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 Greetings, my name is William Two Feather. We are here today to do a scientific project which validates traditional Native American faith healing. The scientist asks, how does this work? What is a decimal point? So that's what we're here to deliver today is that language science through faith techniques. The type of equipment that we're using for this experiment is very sophisticated equipment. Dr. Yorke has been doing this research for over 20 years, but there has not been this type of equipment for 20 years. Well, now there is. So we're embarking on the beginning of the spiritual aspect of language as opposed to the faith aspect of language. Where we go now in the presentation 
is to getting the baseline. This is a little different than an aura photograph that takes a snapshot of your aura at that particular time. What we need here in the baseline is a true baseline. So I sat for 14 minutes. I couldn't blink my eyes, move my head, anything like that in order to get a scientific baseline so that we know where we're starting from. What we have here is upper and lower measurements. In the upper measurements, you'll notice there's four illustrations. The one on the right is the waking state that we're in on a regular basis, which we call the beta. The second stage to the left is what we call the alpha. And this is the place where Dr. Yorke says that most of the healers go into because he's been doing this research for 20 years. And the next one to the left shows the theta, which is the unconscious. And we go one more to the left, which is the delta, the unconscious. Now what we're looking at here is the patterns of the baseline so that we have something to make a comparison with later on in the presentation. The lines on the bottom, the red lines and the blue lines, are kind of like the Richter scale on earthquakes. The thin lines are like a 2 on the Richter scale and the thick lines are like a nine on the Richter scale. It's not two times two, it's two to the power of. So there's two things in this presentation that are scientifically not possible and we will show them to you shortly. This presentation shows the healer juiced up. So when we're talking about juiced up, we're talking about eight minutes for the experiment from beginning to end. So it takes about two minutes for me to get juiced up because I've been doing this for over 15 years. So once we're in a juiced up state, that is the place from which the healing actually occurs. But before the healing is on, we must get to a juiced up situation. What we're looking at here is the bottom right hand corner, these very thick red lines. Science says this is not possible, not in a lifetime or in any time, yet it was accomplished within two minutes, keeping in mind that the whole experiment is eight minutes and it took about two minutes to juice up, leaving six minutes for the rest of the experimentation. Here on the healer comparison, what we're looking at is on the top is before being juiced up, which is the baseline, and then the bottom being juiced up. The comparison we're looking at here on the left-hand side is on the top left-hand side, you see no lines on the far right side. And then on the bottom, after being juiced up, you see a very large, heavy amount of red lines on the right and one to the left as well. Not being a PhD scientist, to explain this in layman terms, just look at it. Now on the right hand side, when you see the color comparisons, you notice that in the beta state, the one that we're in right now, you can see a very large change from the top and the bottom. Then we go into the alpha, which is the altered state as we all know it as. There's a very large change again. But then when we go into the subconscious, in the theta, there's like really no change at all. And then we finally get into the delta which is the unconscious, and we see of the largest change of all. In this slide, 
the actual healing is happening, which is really a return to balance and harmony. But this part of the brain over the right ear that's visible to you has actually been dead. Short-term memory loss. So the objective here basically is to reanimate that part of the brain or effect some type of change to the better. You'll notice the eyes closed on the healer, myself. You'll notice that there's no touching involved. Uh, the head cannot be moved. There can be no blinking, which is a large amount of restrictions. But the objective here is to prove the power of faith. And that's what we're doing. Here in this frame, what we're actually looking at is the lower illustrations and above the right ear you'll see the nose at the top of the pink colored skull there is the blue lines some are thick and some are thin this is the actual part of the brain above the right ear that has the damage and this is the goal we need to go in there and alter that damage in some way, shape, or form. This is the objective. Very nice. Here we are getting close to the end. The client comparison. What we're looking at here is what's different. On the bottom parts, on the left, we can see the before, and on the right, we can see the after. So, in the before, we can see the blue lines that have the thick and thin lines coming from the right area above the ear, which is the area of the brain that has been shut down, short-term memory. And then we have the comparison on the right. Now on the right, there's two sets of pink heads, the bottom line and the top line. On the top line, the first one we see is the blue lines are no longer dominant above the right ear. They've been switched, changed down to the bottom and the back. And on the next frame to the right, there's absolutely no lines whatsoever, which is the after eight minutes of traditional Native American faith healing. So here, we allow everyone to make their own conclusions See what you'll see, but these are not words that I'm just putting on the program. This is scientific evidence that has decimal points that go out 0 .000 and even farther, I believe. So, now we'll continue on to the next frame. We can also look at the colors above, too, and in eight minutes, I see... A distinct change between the left, which is before, and the right after. Eight minutes of no hands-on traditional healing. So there we go. And here we are. The summary. Two Feather, myself, believes that there's actually only two languages in the world. Some people will dispute this with me. I'm okay with that but they are science and faith. Sometimes the faith language people will listen to the science language people, but rarely will the science language people listen to the faith language people. The science people want to see what's the decimal point? How can you prove this? What's going on? So many questions. Fine. So this presentation is given in that light, speaking with the science language so that when science language people see this presentation, what else can you conclude? It's up to you. So have a read there. Thank you for your attention and your time. We're certainly open to any suggestions. And if you have any recommendations where this presentation would be appreciated, in the light it was given, which to me is in a good way and with a good heart, there will be naysayers and that's just part of the world and that's okay too. 
What we don't want to do here is tell you what your conclusions are. It is much better left in the traditional Native American way to make your own conclusions. So, done Joe?